Chapter 18 The sun had almost set and left the sky swathed in smothers of purple and red. I walked down the busy, narrow street that led away from Rahim Khan's building. The street was a noisy lane in a maze of alleyways choked with pedestrians, bicycles, and rickshaws. Billboards hung at its corners, advertising Coca-Cola and cigarettes. Lollywood movies, movie posters displayed sultry actresses dancing with handsome, brown-skinned men in fields of marigolds. I walked into a smoky little samovar house and ordered a cup of tea. I tilted back on the folding chair's rear legs and rubbed my face. That feeling of sliding toward a fall was fading. But in its stead, I felt like a man who awakens in his own house and finds all the furniture rearranged so that every familiar nook and cranny looks foreign now. Disoriented, he has to reevaluate his surroundings, reorient himself. How could I have been so blind? The signs had been there for me to see all along. They came flying back at me now. Baba hiring Dr. Kumar to fix Hassan's hair lip. Baba never missing Hassan's birthday. I remembered the day we were planting tulips when I had asked Baba if he'd ever consider getting new servants. Hassan's not going anywhere, he'd barked. He's staying right here with us where he belongs. This is his home and we're his family. He had wept, wept, when Ali announced he and Hassan were leaving us. The waiter placed a teacup on the table before me. Where the table's legs crossed like an X, there was a ring of brass balls, each walnut-sized. One of the balls had come unscrewed. I stooped to tighten it. I wished I could fix my own life as easily. I, <clears throat> I took a gulp of the blackest tea I'd had in years and tried to think of Soraya, of the general in Jalaka and Kala Jamila, of the novel that needed finishing. I tried to watch the traffic bolting by on the street, the people milling in and out of the little sweet shops, tried to listen to the Kowali music playing on the transistor radio at the next table, anything. But I kept seeing Baba on the night of my graduation, sitting in the Ford he'd just given me, smelling of beer and saying, I wish Hassan had been with us today. How could he have lied to me all those years? To Hassan, he had sat me on his lap when I was little, looked me straight in the eyes and said, there is only one sin and that is theft. When you tell a lie, you steal someone's right to the truth. Hadn't he said those words to me? And now 15 years after I'd buried him, I was learning that Baba had been a thief and a thief of the worst kind because the things he'd stolen had been sacred. From me, the right to know I had a brother, and from Hassan, his identity, and from Ali, his honor, his nang, his namus. The questions kept coming at me. How had Baba brought himself to look Ali in the eye? How had Ali lived in that house day in and day out, knowing he had been dishonored by his master in the single worst way an Afghan man can be dishonored? And how was I going to reconcile this new image of Baba with the one that had been imprinted on my mind for so long, that of him in his old brown suit hobbling up the Tahiri's driveway to ask for Saroya's hand? Here is another cliché my creative writing teacher would have scoffed at. Like father, like son. But it was true, wasn't it? As it turned out, Baba and I were more alike than I'd ever known. I'm going to underline that. And the reason I do that is because this whole book, I mean, I'll, the, the author's right. This whole book, Baba has been set up to look antithetical to Amir, different. And now there's this connection between them, this lie that they both, well, they're both liars. We had both betrayed the people who had given their lives for us. And with that came this realization, that Rahim Khan had summoned me here to atone not just for my sins, but for Baba's too. 
I'm underlining that to atone not just for my sins but for Baba's too and notice the word atone it's like stage 11 the atonement he wants to he wants them to find peace <clears throat> Raheem Khan said I'd always been too hard on myself but I wondered True, I hadn't made Ali step on the on the landmine, and I hadn't brought the Taliban to the house to shoot Hassan, but I had driven Hassan and Ali out of the house. Was it too far fetched to imagine that things might have turned out differently had I if I hadn't? Maybe Baba would have brought them along to America. Maybe Hassan would have had a home of his own now, a job, a family, a life in a country where no one cared that he was a Hazara, where most people didn't even know what a Hazara was. Maybe not, but maybe so. I can't go to Kabul, I had said to Rahim Khan. I have a wife in America, a home, a career, and a family. But how could I pack up and go back home when my actions may have cost Hassan a chance at those very things? I wished Rahim Khan hadn't called me. I wished he had let me live on in my oblivion. But he had called me, and what Rahim Khan revealed to me changed things, made me see how my entire life, long before the winter of 1975, dating back to that single, that singing Hazara woman, was still nursing me, had been a cycle of lies, betrayals, and secrets. There is a way to be good again, he'd said, a way to end the cycle with a little boy, an orphan, Hassan's son, somewhere in Kabul. On the rickshaw ride back to Rahim Khan's apartment, I remembered Baba saying that my problem was that someone had always done my fighting for me. I was 38 now. My hair was receding and streaked with gray, and lately I'd traced little crow's feet etched around the corners of my eyes. I was older now, but maybe not yet too old to start doing my own fighting. Baba had lied about a lot of things as it turned out, but he hadn't lied about that. I looked at the round face in the Polaroid again, the way the sun fell on it, my brother's face. Hassan had loved me once, loved me in a way that no one ever had or ever would again. He was gone now, but a little part of him lived on. It was in Kabul, waiting. I found Rahim Khan praying namaz in a corner of the room. He was just a dark silhouette bowing eastward against a blood-red sky. I waited for him to finish. Then I told him I was going to Kabul told him to call the Caldwells in the morning. I'll pray for you, Amir Jean, he said. <laughs>